Thank you for joining us today. This is the third and last session of the webinar entitled Remote Sensing of Coastal Ecosystems. My name is Juan Torres Perez, and today, as in the other uh, couple of weeks, I'm accompanied by my colleague, Camber McCollum, from the NASA Ames Research Center here in California. So as a reminder, uh, this webinar cons consists of three one-hour sessions, which uh, will be given on August 25th, September 1st, and today, September 8th. The same content is presented on two different times of e on each day at 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. Eastern Time U.S. And the morning session is in English, the, the afternoon session is in Spanish, and you only need to sign up for one of the sessions on each day. Also remember that you can access all the course materials at the web page shown here on the screen. And this includes the PowerPoint presentations and the homework assignment, which will be, will be available today after the end of this uh, session. Then there are gonna be, there's gonna be uh, time for questions and answers at the end of this session, but feel free to add your questions to the live chat at any time uh, during this presentation or you can also submit the questions to the emails shown on the screen, either to myself or to my colleague, Amber McCollum. There's one home homework assignment to complete this course, which will need to be submitted via Google Forms. The homework will become available today at the end of this session on the course uh, website. And remember that to obtain the certificate of completion, you need to attend the live webinars and also to submit the assignment, the homework, on or before September 22nd, which is two weeks after today. Also remember that due to the large number of participants that we usually have in these webinars, it usually takes about two months to receive the certificate. As a reminder, while this is an introductory course, we recommend the Fundamentals of Remote Sensing course or to have an equivalent experience as a prerequisite. Again, all the course materials are available on the web page here shown on the screen. Okay, so we already saw an, in, uh, an overview of major tropical and temperate coastal ecosystems as well as some satellite sensors typically used for analyzing these ecosystems. Last week, we talked about uh, water quality and how the light regime uh, is affected depending on the concentration of different constituents in the water column. And we put all this information in the context of retrieving benthic information from a relatively clear water site, which was a coral reef in the Caribbean. Today, we're gonna present an overview of different types of shorelines, their main components, and how remote sensing and in-situ techniques can be complemented for the mapping and analysis of these areas. So by the end of this session, you'll, you'll be able to identify the main geological features of shorelines, different types of shorelines and beaches, and you'll also be uh, able to summarize ground-based and remote sensing techniques used to characterize shoreline features. By the way, here's one of my preferred beaches in Puerto Rico, the Tombolo Beach in the north coast of the island. And it shows some of the features that we're gonna be talking about today. For instance, in this case, you can see how sediment varies depending on where you are at the beach, you have, you, have, you have more coarser sediments and on this side you have uh, fine grain sediments. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, major components of a shoreline. Most times people tend to talk about uh, the shoreline, the coast, the coastline and the shore, it's kind of the same uh, things, but Actually, geologically and topographically, these are different components of uh, coastal areas. So for instance, the shore, which is shown uh, here on this, uh, on this graph and, 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 and the diagram, and then I have kind of here a, a photo from, from an area in, in the east coast of Puerto Rico to uh, kind of show the same uh, features. The shore 
is the zone between the lowest tide and the highest elevation on land affected by storm waves. So in this particular uh, photo from Puerto Rico, it's pretty much from where I have my pointer, pointer here to about this area over here. So the shore also includes what we usually call the beach, which in a moment we'll see that it's, it's called uh, differently. The coast is the zone that extends uh, from inland from the shore until it usually reaches a zone of higher elevation. And then the shoreline then varies depending on the tides. And in most places, there's a low tide shoreline, there's a high tide shoreline, and it's uh, delineated by the highest part where the waves can reach. So for instance, in this, uh, in the photo here, the Isis area photo, you see here some of the, some of the seagrass that was left here by the, by the high tide. So this would be the high tide shoreline. And then the low tide shoreline is pretty much where, where the waves are breaking here. So this, this whole area. Um, and then the coastline is the boundary between the coast and the shore. So it would be pretty much this uh, line of, uh, of vegetation here in this particular case. By definition, the, a beach is a deposit of uh, unconsolidated sediment, so loose sediment, located uh, on the shore from the coastline to the line of breakers. So obviously this particular area that we're referring to uh, here. And therefore it is the entire active area that experiences changes due to wave action. So some features that we usually also tend to confuse when referring to beaches in particular are the berm are, and also the beach face. So the berm is that dry, slightly elevated margin of the beach that can be found at the foot of the coastal cliffs and dunes. And it is, the, it is the part of the beach that we colloquially call the beach. In this case, what I'm pointing at here with, the, with my, my pointer. Now the beach face is the wet sloping surface that extends from the ocean's facing side of the berm to the shoreline that is the zone between the high tide and the low tide and uh, shorelines. So the, the berm will be this area just right above the, uh, the high tide uh, shoreline. And then the beach face is this area that sometimes, but during high tides is covered by water. Okay, so in general, there are two types of shores, uh, erosional and depositional shores. And they are somewhat linked to the type of continental margin that they're located at. This is usually erosional shores are located in areas affected by tectonic activity. Therefore, inactive margins, such as the, the west coast of the US, for example. They have well-developed cliffs and a number of different features uh, can be seen in these places, such as uh, coves or sea stacks, sea arcs, uh, headlands, the photo here on the upper uh, right shows uh, a couple of these uh, erosional features. You can see the headland over here, and you can see a, a small sea stack here uh, as well. Now, depositional shores, on the other hand, are typical of areas where there's little uh, tectonic activity, hence in passive margins, such as in the east coast of the US. And uh, they usually show large deposits of sediment, so sandy beaches, and other features like barrier islands, river deltas, uh, tombolos, and lagoons. The photo here on the bottom right uh, shows an area in the north coast of Puerto Rico, in this case, uh, by, which is pretty much, by, by the way, the same beach that I, that I showed uh, a couple of slides earlier. Here's uh, the, the beach, the tombolo beach here. And, uh, and it shows uh, what, it, what we call in geological terms a tombolo, which is this area, this sandy area that connects the mainland to, in this case, uh, some beach rocks here uh, along the coastline. Now, having said this, it is it's also usual to see components of both types of uh, shores on active or and or passive margins. And this is also affected by the extension of the continental or island platform, the coastal and different oceanic uh, physical processes, as well as also uh, atmospheric events.
Okay. Now, when we do shoreline uh, morphology characterization, there's a number of different uh, components that we have to uh, consider. First, we need to identify the type of coastline, whether it's a rocky uh, area, a beach area, or a vegetated uh, area. And for instance, in this case, in this, uh, this photo here, you see in, uh, an area in, in Puerto Rico as well that has a, a short beach here, has not been affected by erosion in, in, in this particular case. And there's some vegetated zones uh, as well. Uh, so also in terms of uh, shoreline morphology, then you need to identify areas that are typically prone to erosion or to accretion, which would be the opposite, the, uh, the accumulation of sediments. And it is also really, really useful to identify the types of sediments and, and the composition of these sediments, because that will give you information on not only uh, weathering pattern, patterns in other parts of the watershed, but also from where in particular, where in the watershed uh, these sediments come from. And we can combine remote sensing and in situ techniques to study uh, historical and also present changes in the extension of a particular uh, coastline type. And it, this uh, will help us identify the distribution or the current status of natural or man-made physical barriers, which you'll see uh, in a moment. Okay, so here are uh, some causes, typical causes of shoreline changes uh, through the war. I'm just gonna mention uh, some of them. The uh, definitely uh, tropical or temperate systems like hurricanes or cold fronts can affect the, the distribution of shorelines or the, the different uh, parts of the shoreline. Uh, wave action and obviously cyclonic waves uh, also can affect uh, the coastal uh, coastal areas. The tidal range definitely uh, affects the deposition or the erosion of sediments. Tectonic activity, as we will see in the in a couple of slides, also has an effect on the shoreline changes, and definitely increasing sea surface temperature also the melting of the uh, polar ice caps and eventually the sea level rise has an effect in shoreline changes and particularly in, in really uh, low areas like small islands and definitely human activities have a have a, uh, a big effect on on shorelines uh, such as activities such as uh, sand removal in dunes or, or, or just uh, beaches and even constructions that we usually do to try to uh, help with uh, containing some of the wave action. Speaking of that, of human co uh, constructions, seawalls are some of the least effective methods to contain the effect of wave action and erosion in coastal areas. There's an old saying in Spanish, el mar siempre recupera lo que es suyo, which is literally translated to something like the sea always gains back what belongs to it, or something like that. And uh, sea level has been uh, rising as a result of the melting of the polar ice sheets, as I, as I said uh, uh, some moments ago, at a, at a dramatic rate, particularly in the last century, as we saw during the session one of the series. Here are some photos of uh, northwest, northwest coast of Puerto Rico, where you can see how the combined effect of increased sea level and storm surge has pretty much destroyed this rental houses uh, in one of the most touristic zones of the island. So obviously this creates vast economy, uh, economic issues uh, in an area that's already affected by the uh, by economy. Now I mentioned tectonic action. Uh, and tectonic action, while sometimes can be subtle, uh, can also affect the condition of coastal areas, particularly in small islands or sites uh, located at or near sea level. Here are two aerial photos that show uh, how some of the coastline in South uh, Puerto Rico was impacted by a 6.4 earthquake that happened in January of this year, in 2020. And uh, there were some structural and geomorphological studies that have shown that the coast here has sunk about eight inches as a consequence of this tectonic activity 
uh, of that particular earthquake and um, more than 3,000 replicas that happened since then. Uh, so in this case, you can actually see as a reference, here's a, here's a, this line of, of tires, just you know, car tires that were used kind of as a barrier uh, here. Uh, this is a photo from March uh, 2018, and you see where they are at right now, right where they were at right after after the uh, the earthquake, and you see that the sea is already has already taken place. It's at some of the, these areas here, so you see the entrance of the of the, of the sea level here. Um, so aerial photography and possibly high resolution satellite imagery can aid in conducting such analysis uh, like this one. And as means to inform the local government agencies and the importance of prioritizing uh, some of these areas before it's obviously too late. So let's talk a little bit about some advantages of using remote sensing to study shoreline changes. Um, definitely, uh, two of the main advantages of using remote sensing is that it allows for the assessment of the current state of the shoreline at a time of, uh, of the image uh, capture. And it also allows for both quantitative and qualitative evaluation of the shoreline components. And uh, I want to mention, obviously, that uh, with uh, satellite series like the Landsat series, you can do time series analysis uh, all, for almost uh, almost 50 years. It's been around since 70, so 1972. And so it allows for comparisons between different time periods uh, or even different sites. And you can also combine, as we will see through this uh, session, you can combine different tools depending on the goals of the, of the project. So we will see some examples of uh, combinations of optical versus radar uh, data, also satellite and airborne uh, images, particularly historical images. And on these days, it's more and more common uh, the use of drones for analyzing uh, coastal and shoreline, shoreline changes. Those two photos that I showed earlier from Puerto Rico and the impacts of the tectonic activity were collected by drones. And uh, you can definitely, depending on the type of data that you use, you can use you can do the uh, study, concentrated study on particular uh, spatial scales. Uh, also, either either uh, more coarse or more fine scales uh, resolution, depending on the on on the uh, problem that you are uh, studying. Here's an example of how the Landsat series can be used to follow changes in land cover and land use in a watershed through time. In this case from 1976 to to, to 2016. This is an area where agriculture used to dominate in the 1960s, 1970s, and then as a result of the location of many, many pharmaceuticals in Puerto Rico, agriculture was diminished significantly, and then eventually the, uh, the majority of these lands were, uh, co co were uh, converted to a secondary forest. In this case, uh, this is uh, one advantage of having a data set such as that of Landsat, that it's uh, freely available to researchers. You can do this type of uh, uh, time series analysis for either watersheds or for uh, specific coastlines. There's another example here also the, uh, to Landsat 8, in this case, uh, through color images that show the advantage of particularly using the coastal band for uh, following events such as uh, uh, algal bloom events or even the river plumes also. So despite the 30 meter pixel resolution, it also uh, allows for studying shoreline changes, uh, particularly at the continental uh, scale, but also on the island scale, depending on, on the size of the island and the size of the shoreline. So as I mentioned before, historical photographs can be combined with satellite imagery in a geographical information system, or GIS, to study shoreline changes through time. Here in the uh, series of photos on the left, we see how what is now the La Palguera Natural Reserve in Southwest Puerto Rico has changed over years from a very, very small fishing uh, village shown here in 1936 uh, to a relatively well-developed town. And actually this is an aerial photo from 1977. It's even bigger. And this, nowadays it's, this is one of the most populated touristic areas in Puerto Rico. And, uh, and a worldwide recognized diving destination in particular. So on the right here, we see a GIS analysis of shoreline changes in the island using images from these same years. 
that show the retreat in particular of the coastline along in the in the west coast of the island. In this case, as a result of both uh, sea level rise, but also uh, tectonic activity. Here's data from a study by Mann and uh, Westfall from uh, 2014 uh, that was published in the journal uh, Remote Sensing that, uh, that shows, uh, it was conducted in, in Papua New Guinea in this case, and it shows uh, where they use uh, historical data, historical uh, photographic data, uh, and quick bird and world view satellite uh, data to study shoreline changes here. And you can see the dynamic nature of the shoreline uh, through time. One third of the islands uh, showed a statistically significant, de significant decrease in beach width with time, in this case apparently due to human activities and also uh, long short sediment transport. And here's uh, some of the data that I was just mentioning. Particularly if you look at the at some of the graphs here, you'll see the changes in the shoreline, and particularly in, in beach uh, width, here in, in, in meters, uh, from let's say from the 1940s all the way to uh, present day to the to 2012. In this case, you see the pretty much a retreat of the of the beach line here uh, in the in, in particularly most of these uh, the, their study areas around the Papua New Guinea. So it shows the effects clearly shows the effects of uh, particularly of uh, sea level uh, rise uh, and also effects of uh, long short sediment transport in, in these areas. Okay, so let's talk a little bit for uh, uh, for a while about dunes, beaches, and, uh, and sub wetland types. And again, remember that we will not cover all wetland types in particular. Um, in fact, we're just gonna mention two of them, mangroves in the tropical uh, areas and salt marshes in the temperate, temperate ecosystems. Uh, but a webinar is already in preparation. Uh, and it's going to be out there soon, also from our RCET program, that it's, it's particularly aimed at wetlands and, uh, and, and mainly on, on mangroves. So they, they will be covered in much greater detail uh, on that, on that uh, other webinar. So stay tuned for that one. Okay, let's talk a, a bit about coastal dunes. Coastal dunes are a ridge or a series of uh, ridges uh, that form at uh, uh, at the rear of the beach and, and differ from most other constructional uh, coastal landforms, natural landforms, in that they are formed by the, the movement of air or what is called aeolian transport, rather, but rather than by tidal, wave, or even current action. So the initiation of uh, aeolian transport is controlled by wind velocity, the characteristic of sediments, whether they're fine or, or, or coarse uh, uh, size uh, sediments, beach morphology, uh, even moisture co content, and the degree of roughness uh, of the elements that are present, or wh even whether there's a, a driftwood or vegetation in the area. So the movement of sediment back into the into the back beach environment often results in the formation of what we know as coastal dunes. Vegetation always, uh, often, often plays a significant role in the initial inf formation and subsequent development of coastal dunes. In coastal, in coastal environments, plants are the most common roughness element that can cause a reduction in wind velocity and reduce the capacity of the wind to maintain aeolian transport and significantly increase the potential of trapping sand. So for this reason, artificial plantings of uh, dune grass or other uh, similar plants it's, com it's a common method to, en to encourage the formation of dunes and the growth of dunes. Beach morphology also plays an important role in the supply of and transportation of aeolian sediment, and sediment into the back beach environment and in the formation of dunes. Changes in the slope and morphology of the back beach and back shore profiles can increase or decrease uh, wind velocity resulting in variations in the rate of transport and accumulation of sediment. Uh, so there are two different types of, uh, of uh, general types of, of coastal dunes. One of them are vegetated dunes, which are the typical dunes that we usually see on the shorelines. And there are also transverse dunes that lack vegetation and they, they generally migrate. And these are the typical dunes that we see in deserts, uh, for example. 
Okay. Now let's talk a bit about the different beach types. And uh, there are two main types of beaches, and there are some variations of these depending on where you are in the world. But in general, they are uh, what are what are called dissipative beaches, and also reflective uh, beaches. So dissipative beaches are uh, they usually develop under high wave conditions where there is an abundant supply of particularly of medium to fine grain sands, and in areas where the surf zone is, a, is wide and there's a gentle slope, so usually less than five degrees. And also in areas that are more dominated by wave action. And these beaches usually have a wide beach face and they usually lack a, a berm. Here in the, in, the, in the bottom left photo, here's an example of a dissipative beach in, in Australia. Um, in the in the case of reflective beaches, uh, they are generally composed of uh, coarse grain material requiring higher uh, higher threshold velocity to overcome the the uh, the friction of sediments, and the and the, the the steeper profile and the more irregular nature of the of this uh, beach also results in a zone a zone that it's uh, usually of uh, reduced uh, wind speeds. Uh, in the area, and in, the, in this case of a, of a reflective beaches, they usually have a more coarser sands and, and even a steeper uh, slope also. And in contrast to dissipative beaches, reflective beaches are more dominated by tides. Here's an, uh, an example, also in Australia, uh, in this case of a, of a reflective beach, and you can see the a, a much bigger development of, of the berm in this uh, in this particular beach. Uh, beaches are, are really very, very dynamic environments. The, the extension of the beach and also the uh, the width of the beach can change in short periods of time. And, uh, and this can be part of the natural beach cycle or it can be, by, be a consequence of a major natural event such as a hurricane or the, uh, cyclonic wave or something uh, similar to that. And this is what makes the local knowledge and the collection of in-situ data particularly useful during, and even collecting in-situ data during the satellite overpass, particularly useful uh, for an accurate image processing analysis. Here's an example of a beach in San Juan, uh, in North Coast of Puerto Rico. And you see the dates here. And this is exactly the same beach, uh, the same photographs taken in the same vantage point, uh, by all means. August uh, 11, 2019, you see that there's pretty much no beach at all uh, in this area. I mean, there's a what we can probably call a beach phase here that is uh, covered by water. And in September, September 11, you see the formation of a pretty wide beach here. So you can see that in a month period, areas uh, that are affected by a number of different oceanic uh, processes can definitely change uh, dramatically. You see that also in terms of the sediment composition of, the, of some of these beaches. Here's uh, two beaches from the northwest uh, coast of the island in, in Puerto Rico as well. The Guajataca Beach, which is here more on the northern side, and then Rincón Beach here on the, on the more on the northwest. And you see from month to month, uh, and these are just just three different months, but but it shows uh, how how the the sediment composition changes in the in a relatively short period of time. This is more of a sandy uh, sediment, and uh, at least in this case, whereas in the November of this particular year, it was more of a terrestrial, uh, uh, terrigenous sediments. You see all the black uh, grain, big uh, coarse uh, grains here. And uh, in the case of Rincon Beach here on the on the west, on the northwest, you see that it was actually in October where it saw this uh, difference, different difference in. In sediments, and um, by the way, both beaches are they are located really close to the river mouth. In this case, the Guajataca River here, and in this case, the Añasco River. So the composition of sediments that you see here is a result, is most likely a result of uh, of rainfall events or something like that that moved some of these, particularly some of the terrestrial sediment, to the to the coastal area, to the beach here. 
And here in the in the bottom photo, you see some some examples of these sediments in, in petri dishes uh, for analysis. You and I want I want you to pay attention to this particular one, to the uh, to the black one, that shows uh, this is pure magnetite. So it's a sediment that comes directly from the watershed, uh, from the upper parts of the watershed, in particular. Uh, so it's not sediment that was produced at the beach. In, uh, at least in this in this particular uh, area. Here's a uh, very quickly uh, again the same the same uh, the two photos of the same beach where you see here how it changes from one month to the other in October and September here. This was more of a fine grain kind of like a transition beach between uh, reflective and dissipative beach. And here, this is more of a, a dissipative beach in this in this case, more of a, a coarser uh, sediments. Um, but it, you can see the, how, how, how fast the beaches can change just in a matter of weeks. And kind of along the same lines, here's some of the data that we have been collecting in, in Puerto Rico. We collected this area uh, as part of a NASA funded project some years ago. And you see here's, here's two different beaches. Um, and this are in this particular case, La, La Boca Beach on the on the west side of, of the Manatee River mouth here, and Machuca Beach on the east side of the of the river. And here's some graph that shows uh, the different in composition of sediments in particular. You see that. But uh, for instance, uh, this one, and it's kind of obvious, you can see that's how, how dark the, the, the sands are. It's more uh, of a, have more of a terrigenous components so or land-based uh, uh, sediments. Versus in here, in the, this one, Machuca Beach, and it has a, a more varied uh, composition. It can be either biogenic or, or terrigenous or even some carbonates uh, as well. The, and, uh, and the reason, the main reason here is that usually once uh, once the, the river plume comes out because of a, after a rain event, it actually flows more towards the west instead of the east. So that's why this La Boca uh, beach here in particular, it changes uh, really, really dramatically uh, in, in a matter of, of days. Okay, let's talk a little bit about wetlands then. And uh, wetlands are ecosystems in which the water table is, is close to the uh, surface. So they are, part, they are typically saturated with water most of the time. The primary factor that distinguishes wetlands from other landforms or water bodies is the characteristic vegetation of aquatic plants. Wetlands can border either freshwater or brackish or even marine environments, depending on, depending on where they are located at. Wetlands are extremely, extremely important ecosystems, both ecologically and economically. They play a number of functions in coastal areas. For instance, they provide habitats for hundreds of species, including plants and animals, and also other ecosystem services for humans, such as recreation, fisheries, coastal protections, and they serve as natural water filters and help stab stabilize uh, shorelines, among other uh, services. Salt marshes are usually bordered by grassy areas that extend inland from, from mud, mud flats Salt marshes can also develop around sheltered open coast as long as the uh, disturbance from wave action is, is minimal, allowing the accumulation of uh, muddy sediments. In the US, salt marshes are uh, particularly extensive along the Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico. Now we talk about mangrove forests in some detail in during session one, um, and they are more typical of tropical coasts and well, they're usually dominated by a few mangrove species. They do harbor an immense amount, I mean, immense community of algae and invertebrates and serve as nursery grounds for a number of fish and shellfish species. Mangroves are particularly important in coastal protection as well as in trapping sediments coming from the nearby watersheds. This is a simplified uh, path for image processing for coastal wetlands, although it, uh, it also applies for any, any other land area. So before the analysis, usually the, the imagery must be radiometrically and geometrically corrected. The radiometric correction reduces the influence of haze and other atmosp uh, atmospheric scattering particles and any sensor anomalies. And the geometric, geometric uh, correction compensates for the Earth's rotation and variations in the position and the altitude of the satellite 
on these days, these products, uh, the products available from most sensors are already corrected for these two factors. So this step is already uh, taken into consideration when you get the image. Um, then the image segmentation usually simplifies uh, uh, the, the analysis by dividing the image into homogeneous patches or ecologically distinct areas. And image classification can be done either through supervised or unsupervised classification. Unsupervised classification uses an algorithm to identify the spectral classes, and the analyst uh, subsequently assigns informal class names to the algorithm identified uh, classes. During the supervised uh, classification, on the other hand, the analyst that identified the regions of the image known as training areas to represent the typically uh, spectral classes that make up the informational classes. The classification algorithm then classifies each uh, pixel based on the comparison with the training data. And uh, some cluster analysis is also used to compare uh, training and versus classified data and to develop an optimal set of uh, spectral signatures. Then the final image uh, classification is performed. And through this process, ancillary data, such as aerial photos, maps, or field samples can be used uh, whenever they're available. Here's some indices typically used for assessing vegetation health. The vegetation indices are generally calculated as a ratio of the reflectance values in, in different portions of the electromagnetic spectrum, along with some of the biophysical uh, characters, characteristics. Other parameters require, usually require ground-based data in conjunction with uh, remote sensing data to generate land cover uh, maps, uh, for example. So let's just briefly mention if each of the of the indices. NDVI, for instance, uses a ratio between the red and NR and near infrared regions of the spectrum, and it's probably the most used index to study uh, vegetation health, uh, phenology, and other parameters as well. EVI, or enhanced vegetation index, is a similar index, but it also incorporates the blue band of the spectrum. And EVI is usually used in areas where NDVI tends to saturate, uh, such as high vegetation density areas. SAVI, on the other hand, or Soil Adjusted Vegetation Index, is more useful for in areas where there's a there's a great a greater bare ground cover than vegetation, and it minimizes the influence of bare ground. It still uses the red and near infrared bands, but uh, it incorporates also a correction factor. And there are other indices, such as the MSAVI, uh, SATV, and NBR, which has been used, uh, have been used in many application areas, such as agriculture or forest ecology, but may also be applied to, to, to wetland areas, to study wetland areas. Uh, some uh, estimations of biophysical parameters include the, the fraction of PAR, or photosynthetically active radiation, and it's a parameter using remote sensing and an ecosystem modeling that, sig that signifies that the portion of the PAR that is actually used by, by plants. FPAR is commonly used in ecosystem models because it has an important uh, influence on, ex uh, on exchanges of energy, water vapor, and carbon dioxide between the surface of the Earth and the atmosphere. Fractional cover is particularly useful in, in agricultural applications that is, it allows land managers to determine which parts of their property chose a heavier grazing or are underutilized. And for coastal wetlands, it can be used to see the lineations of different types of wetlands or plants cover. The leaf area index is a, is a variable that is a dimensionless, dimensionless variable and a ratio of leaf area per unit uh, ground surface area. It can be related to gas vegetation exchange processes such as photosynthesis, um, evapotranspiration, even carbon flux, and it's applicable to both land and wetland regions. Now, all these indices are covered in much more detail in our recent training uh, given by my colleague Amber McCollum on understanding phenology with remote sensing, and I encourage you to see it for more information. Additionally, last May, uh, along with our colleague Erica Podes, 
from JPL, we conducted a four-session session webinar on the use of SAR, Synthetic Aperture Radar, radar for forest mapping and monitoring. And in that seminar, there's one whole section on monitoring mangroves and similar wetland areas using SAR. And even it includes an, an exercise with the Sentinel toolbox. So I also encourage you to see that webinar, uh, to look for that webinar in the ARCET webpage. Okay, now a little bit a little bit about shoreline topography, bathymetry, and some methods that are used for studying these. When studying shoreline processes, you need to take into consideration the topography and the hydrography of the study area, as many of these change drastically from place to place, as we have seen. Usually it involves considering long-term versus short-term changes, how the beach, if there's a beach, uh, changes through time, which type of events have occurred in the area in recent or historical times, and whether these have uh, been more erosional or depositional events, and if, even if there's a wetland, uh, and then how it behaves, and the dominant groups of plants or under their phenology, and how vegetation has been modified by atmospheric or geologic events. Here are some photos of a group of students uh, 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 from the University of Puerto Rico doing beach profiling and measuring the extent of erosion in a local beach in the North Coast. Here are some of the methods that are used for mapping bathymetry in shallow waters and, uh, and in, in the topography also in adjacent uh, beaches. And in the next uh, several slides, we're gonna go over uh, these in some detail, but uh, they include uh, spectroscopy, waterline, which is probably one of the most used uh, methods for particularly for topography and, and bathymetry, uh, the use of interferometric SAR, uh, radar altimetry, and aquatic uh, color radiometry. And I want to mention here are uh, some references from particular projects or uh, uh, papers that have used some of these methods. And uh, at the end of the during the, of the Q and A session, and in the Q and A document, we'll make sure that I include this reference uh, for the benefit of, of you. So let's go. Let's talk about each of them in in, in some detail then. Submeter spectroscopy, uh, stereoscopic, I mean, uh, satellite imagery has the potential to provide an alternative to field collection techniques and has allowed the collection of high spatial resolution topographic data over large areas. The first constellation of uh, civilian satellites that collected uh, stereoscopic images and applied digital terrain model reconstruction to large areas was the French SPOT mission. Satellite pool observation de la, de la Terre. And more recently, the Pleiades constellation has also allowed the collection of stereoscopic data at a resolution of about 0.7 meters. Pleiades has the advantage of revisiting the same place in one day, so it is particularly useful for monitoring of rapid coastal processes, such as erosion caused by a cyclonic wave or similar atmospheric events. Pleiades consists of two optical satellites, 1A and 1B, and they fly over the same orbit. Here's an image of the Polynesian island of Bora Bora, collected by Pleiades uh, some years ago. And you can see the resolution, and you can even see some of the, uh, some of the stereoscopic uh, features. As, uh, for instance, some of the uh, building structures here are on the populated areas. You can also see some coastal features in great detail also. Makes you want to be there right now. The waterline method, as I said, is the most widely used techniques for constructing intertidal uh, digital elevation models. And it, it involves combining remote sensing with hydrodynamic modeling. The waterline refers to the land sea boundary or, or the shoreline in an intertidal area and it consists on detecting the waterline edge in remotely sensed uh, images. Then waterline pixel, pixels are geocoded and the heights are assigned to these using the water level information produced by the hydrodynamic model for the observed area at the time of the, when the image was acquired. From these, from a series of, uh, of images uh, covering the entire tidal range, a set of water lines is assembled 
and interpolated to form a graded digital, digital elevation model, or DEM. The technique assumes that there are no major changes occurring in the topography of the intertidal area during the image acquisition period. For example, no major erosion or depositional changes uh, during that time. And for this method, usually SAR images are typically uh, used for, for this uh, kind of data, this analysis. Nonetheless, optical data can also be used and or even combined with SAR uh, if there's no cloud cover in particular. The INSAR method uses two or more SAR images taken from different positions, different times or both, to extract topographic information based on their phase difference. The images are known as a master and slave, as it is in the case in many uh, other uh, SAR processing techniques or applications. And the method involves uh, co-registration of the images and the formation of an interferogram. In general, the interferogram is a it's basically a complex image with an amplitude measuring the cross correlation of the images used and a phase uh, representing the phase difference between the two images that contains the topographic information. I create intertidal DEMs require a short temporal baseline and therefore it's, it's usually recommended to use single pass interferometry. This is data from systems that have two different antennas in the same platform instead of data from two different systems. As for mangroves, we highly recommend watching the forest mapping and monitoring with SAR data RSET webinar, where our colleague uh, Erika Podest goes into much more details regarding the specifications of SAR data and how to use them. Now also radar altimetry can be used for direct measurements of uh, bottom topography over intertidal zones, uh, during, particularly during low tide episodes. Here's an example from uh, Salome et al. from a couple of years ago, 2018, where they incorporated data from different altimeters, uh, ERS2, uh, MVSAT, Cryosat, SARA, SARA, to study bathymetric changes in the, the Alcacon Bay in West France. Here, the authors also incorporated airborne topographic LIDAR, uh, LIDAR data and water level records uh, measured in situ by the French Hydrographic, Hydrographic Service uh, as ancillary data. The LIDAR is used to fill the LIDAR topography data with water, allowing the discrimination between emerged and submerged areas during the analysis. And finally, aquatic color radiometry, as we saw last week, is used to, for retrieving biogeochemical and water quality parameters for coastal and oceanic waters. For optically shallow waters, which is defined as a aquatic areas where the remote sensing reflectance is affected by the bottom substrate, aquatic color uh, radiometry also provides information on the bottom albedo, which is, this is how much the, the bottom reflects, and water depth as a result of the analysis process. Therefore, in these waters, just as, such as in clear tropical coastal waters, the remote sensing reflectance con contains information on, on the bottom albedo, the concentration of water column components, and the attenuation of light. To solve all these parameters, ideally, it would be better to have hyperspectral data. Nonetheless, may not be available for all the sites. With bottom topography uh, variability is relatively small, then multispectral data can be used, can also be used particularly if it is of high or very high spatial resolution. The figures here on the, on the right show an analysis conducted very recently by James Goodman and his team in the Molokai in the Hawaii. During 2017, as part of the Hispiri preparatory mission campaign, the average hyperspectral sensor was flown on board the ER2 uh, platform and collected information on a number of reef and coastal areas in multiple islands in Hawaii. At the same time, teams involved, teams of divers uh, and uh, researchers were collecting in situ data in the field to validate the imagery collected by the sensor. Some of this data was compared to older data sets collected with the same sensor in the year 2000. And in this case, particularly for this island, it didn't show 
practically no difference in, in bathymetry uh, at all. But it's, it's, it's an example of, of how to use some of this uh, aquatic radiometry data for uh, estimating bathymetry. All right, let's talk uh, uh, very shortly about marine debris and how it affects the collection of remotely sensed data uh, along the shorelines. Anthropogenic marine debris is one of the most important pollutants in the oceans. Millions of tons of debris across the oceans, uh, including coastal areas, have created a critical environmental problem. About 50 to 90% of all the uh, debris in the ocean is actually plastic of different sizes from microplastics to macroplastics, more than one inch in diameter. And this includes anything from microbeads to plastic bottles, uh, the relic fishing gear, plastic bags, and many other types. We have all seen photos or videos of marine fauna affected by this, and not only the flora and fauna are affected, but it also creates an, an aesthetic problem in many locations where most of the economy uh, actually depends on tourism. Usual field methods can aid in the removal of these pollutants, but is, but is uh, usually limited and costly. And particularly when it comes to mapping areas that are affected by debris or areas that are uh, in really in, in isolated areas, remote areas, it's particularly hard uh, to do marine cleanups. Remote sensing then can provide a mean for mapping extensive areas affected by marine debris, uh, not, on, all over, not only all over the ocean, but also in particular shorelines. Here's an, a recent example from Acuna Rus uh, et al. in Chile, where they were exploring the, the spectral signatures of different types of uh, marine debris. In this case, they they took uh, spectral samples of plastic beads, uh, cigarette butts, uh, uh, fishing gear, microplastics, uh, styrofoam in particular, and even bags of different different types of on, on sources. And they saw that uh, that in this case, styrofoam actually uh, have a particular uh, reflectance that is uh, somehow different from the some of the other most of the other materials. So in this case, they they transform the in situ spectral data collected to the actual bands, the, the wavelengths where the actual bands of World View 3 in particular uh, uh, collect information to see whether they could use in situ data and remote sensing data uh, collected by, by World View in this case to separate the different components. And they saw that, you, what well, you can see here, in the, particularly in the right graph, you see that sun is, is fairly different from the others. But most of the, of the marine debris that they uh, collected spectral data from, they were kind of similar, very similar with each other. So it's, it's, it was particularly hard to separate them. And like I said, styrofoam in particular was very different from the others. There's been some other uh, attempts also, particularly I want to mention one by Garaba and Heidi Rilsen in, in 2018, where they have also been collecting spectral uh, libraries um, on, on marine debris, try to separate them into different categories for an eventual, uh, eventual uh, remote sensing assessment on marine debris in the ocean, not, on, not necessarily in coastal areas, but also in the open ocean, such as the plastic, the big uh, Pacific plastic patch. And, and here's a, uh, more data from Acuna Rus, where they show that it actually depends when you collect a spectral signal, it's very important to consider whether they're, you're collecting it, particularly if you're doing it in situ, if you're collecting it from the from the upper surface or the bottom surface or, or any uh, material. And this is what they show here, how it varies depending on whether you're using the bottom surface or the upper surface, or in this case, different types of uh, styroforms. So something to keep in mind, particularly when collecting uh, in-situ data for these purposes. Okay, here's a summary of what, we, what we've talked so far. So uh, shorelines are highly dynamic areas, as we saw, dominated by climate or anthropogenic factors. Shoreline topography and bathymetry can be obtained by a number of different remote sensing methods, that, uh, and we mentioned a few of them. And, and diverse uh, uh, image sources also. Remotely sensed data uh, allows for short and long-term scale uh, studies. 
and provide valuable information that can be used particularly for decision-making processes on um, coastal uh, areas. And uh, remote sensing data can include the combination of, on just satellite, different type of satellites, or even satellites and uh, historical aerial data uh, from, from many uh, decades ago. Okay, so remember that uh, uh, you can contact me or contact my my colleague Amber McCollum at the email address is shown on the screen here. If you have specific inquiries about the RCEP program, you may contact our program director, Dr. Ana Prados, also, and also uh, make sure that you go into our website and look for the different RCEP webinars that are given uh, with our team, um, specific topics uh, that you might be interested in. We're gonna go in a moment to the Q&A session, but remember that you can enter your questions into the Q&A box, and we're gonna post the questions and answer, uh, answers on the training website uh, following the conclusion of this course, uh, usually a couple of days after. And now with that, thank you very much. I wanna uh, thank you for the opportunity of, uh, of conducting this webinar and also for your participation. And let's go into the Q&A session. Okay, thanks everyone. This is one. Let's go to the Q and A. If uh, my uh, colleague can help me, you know, uh, uh, putting it on the screen, we can go over some of the questions that we have already answered uh, while we were giving this the the webinar. Thanks everyone for participating. Again, we have more than a thousand, more than actually more than eleven hundred people part, uh, attending this session and that has been constant through the whole webinar series. So thank you very much for your uh, continuous uh, support. And uh, let's go into some of the some of the Q&A's. Uh, if, uh, Brock, if you can just uh, probably uh, increase the size of it a little bit. So there you go, thank you. Okay, uh, um, and by the way, I want to mention that similarly to uh, last week during the we have the during the Spanish session in particular, we had one of my very uh, one of my dearest colleagues, uh, my uh, former PhD advisor from the University of Puerto Rico, Dr. Roy Armstrong, with us, and uh, and uh, he might even be able to provide some feedback if it's needed during the Q&A as well. So thanks, Roy, for uh, being here again. Uh, and, and, as, and as always, you already, we also have uh, uh, my uh, colleague, Amber McCollum from, from Ames, uh, <clears throat> providing support. So here we go. Uh, question number one, do you mean that we don't have a shoreline? <laughs> Uh, no, we do have, uh, you, you, there's def definitely a shoreline. Um, um, the way that I described it, the, the different features along the shoreline were based on the, on geological, uh, on the geological sense. And, uh, and like I said, so geologically, there are pretty much, uh, you can consider that there are pretty much two shorelines. The one of the high tide that's usually marked by the deposition of some sort of marine vegetations or particular types of sediment. Um, like coarse and coarse grain sediments, uh, for instance, or in case of vegetation, if there's if it, if it's an area that it's uh the bottom is is uh covered by let's say uh, seagrass, or or that sort of uh of uh, excuse me of uh of of, of uh, underwater vegetation, you can you can see some of it being washed ashore, and it usually marks the the, the high tide line, and uh, and then and then there's the other one. The other uh, shoreline, which by definition is at the low tide mark. Okay, uh, what are uh, tombolos? I want to thank here my colleagues uh, Selwyn for uh, for answering this and uh, very straightforward. Uh, a tombolo is a strip of sand that it's that actually connects uh, two pieces of land together. So as you saw in the in the presentation, in that particular case, what I was showing was the mainland. And then the tombolo connecting the mainland to an area that is uh, pretty much a uh, beach rock on the uh, facing the ocean, the ocean side. Okay, um, is uh, coastal sand used for construction? Is it not too coarse for that? Uh, unfortunately, it's very common. 
not only uh, uh, beach sand, but also dunes are, are used a lot in, in some places for uh, uh, for construction, the dune, dune sand, because uh, sometimes it's it's what it's there. It's not there's not a they're not it's usually using areas that where there are not all, uh, that many other materials or materials are very limited. So you know, beach sand and or dune sand uh, uh, can be of different sizes. Uh, thinking about the second question, is it coarse? No, it can be a the, the the grain size can be varied but can vary depending on the origin and the composition from, from fine grain sands to uh, to more coarser uh, boulders. Okay. Um, uh, question number four here is, uh, I developed, this is a pretty long one, I'll go almost straight to the question, but uh, I developed a watershed model giving me the nutrient and sediment loadings and I have uh, remote sensing products to spend the sediment concentration and chlorophyll A. And I want to study the relationship between these uh, two data sets. My question is, what would be the reasonable distance to see or examine the sediment or nutrient loadings uh, effects to the uh, shore area of the watershed? And uh, and then uh, uh, what would be the best buffer zone? Is it five kilometers or ten kilometers from the from the watershed outlet? Um, I I would say that depends on the number of factors, uh, particularly the size of the watershed, the size of the sediment plume, or a typical sediment plume during during rain events. Uh, also depends on the type of sediments that are washing from the from the coastal zone, the hydrodynamics within the uh, the, the coastal zone. Uh, ocean currents, well, coastal currents, uh, even longshore transport of, of, of suspended sediments. So there's a there's a number of factors there. Um, I can't. Don't come. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm not gonna say specifically. Is it five kilometers or ten kilometers uh, best? But uh, but uh, let me see here, uh, Roy. If you're online, can you? I don't know if you want to provide some more feedback on on it. Uh, no, I think we can get back to that after uh, the session. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> okay. Uh, question number five. Then, uh, let's see, can you go up a little bit uh, there, Brock? It mapping shoreline changes, question number five. In mapping shoreline changes, the use of different image uh, spatial resolutions will resort in different details. Um, positional accuracy, how to decide the uh, appropriate image resolution for this application. I think it's, uh, Brock, if you can go, if you can move the the document a little bit up, I can probably uh, go over some of what I what I wrote there. Um, but uh, but I would say, uh, yeah, it is true. Uh, it will give you different results, obviously, depending on the depending on the on the on the resolution. So the the, I would say that the appropriate resolution will, will depend on your study site, uh, the size of it, and it's, it's very importantly, the, your, what is your research question? What is it that you want to answer with, with, with this data? Uh, so in general, I would say I would recommend using imagery not, not, uh, of uh, 30 meters or or even higher resolution if if there's available uh as particularly with, with uh, some of the some of those these changes can be very subtle depending on the on, on the hydrodynamics of the of the place and and, and on this depending on the environment and, but also um it will depend on on the on your study site and how, how big how small it is and whether you can whether you need you know higher spatial resolution to see those changes Okay, question number uh, six. Let's see, I have it open here in my... Number six said, uh, there is, I don't know if my computer is frozen for some reason, but I, don't, I can't see the document. Um, but I, I have some of it right here. Um, what's the best? Remote sensing products for suspended sediment concentration and chlorophyll A. Well, we covered this in in sessions one and two, so uh, I would say please uh, refer to to that. 
uh, to those two sessions. And also, uh, this is a topic that has been covered you know, extensively in other uh, webinar set webinars, uh, particularly related to water quality uh, also. So uh, I would uh, encourage the person who asked this particular question to, to feel free to to, to uh, see some of those others uh, uh, webinar just for the for the sake of time in this during this particular uh, uh, session here. Okay, uh, how do I uh, differentiate shoreline changes due to tides or in sea level rise? Are there remote sensing techniques to remove the effects in tides on sea level model? So as I as I covered in the in the webinar and uh, and uh, um, there there are different methods for taking uh, topographic information around the shoreline. I would think in this particular case, using something like the uh, the waterline method that I method that I described uh, could be really useful, uh, particularly because uh, waterline method takes into consideration uh, both the hydrodynamics and also the location of the uh, high and low tide uh, areas. Okay, um, let's say which. Uh, Number eight, which uh, software have you used to, to do shoreline watershed changes uh, with Landsat? And uh, why did you use that particular software? So uh, this, uh, you can do shoreline or watershed changes uh, in with typical uh, common, or let's we'll say with common uh, image analysis and geographical information system software like uh, ArcGIS, ArcPro, QGIS. Uh, probably even Google Earth Engine, I would say maybe, um, and, and, and similar ones. So just just the usual uh, image analysis uh, software, MB maybe. Okay, is the resolution good enough to allow for most sensing of coastline small islets, like less than 100 meters in diameter? Uh, additionally, higher accurate satellite-based altimetry as opposed to say multi-beam sonar. Uh, is there a tutorial guide on how to map uh, battery material from uh, satellites? Uh, I will go on the opposite direction. There's a, there's there are papers that, that talk about uh, particularly about how to map uh, bathymetry from from satellites in detail. And I'm pretty sure that they should there should be you know. Uh, several books out there uh, also on how to use uh, on the use of, of satellite data for bathymetry. So we'll do an, a search on that. Uh, if I find any, I'll, I'll make sure that I post uh, uh, a link to, to some of those. Uh, and this is kind of similar to the question that I that I just uh, answered above. I, I would uh, definitely recommend, in this case, it's less than 100 meters, so definitely something higher than even 30 meters. I, I'm saying 30 meters pixel size there. But uh, but definitely a higher resolution, maybe uh, Sentinel data or 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 uh, commercial data such as uh, WorldView and, and others. Uh, with WorldView, you they, you have probably the advantage that it also it's been out there for for a while, so so you can do uh, at least I think at least for a decade or so you can do some some. Uh, 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 shoreline changes analysis uh, with uh, with WorldView, uh, and like I said, there multi-beam sonar can be can provide highly detailed uh, uh, information, um, not only about major uh, seafloor features, but also more 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 uh, uh, detailed uh, features, more fine scale uh, uh, features. Um, Usually, multi-beam sonar is, uh, is transported by a boat, right? So there's uh, obviously that that, that limitation uh, there. You can, you can use it for uh, for for seafloor uh, mostly. Uh, what is the most effective methods for uh, remotely detecting and mapping coastal freshwater springs? Honestly, I don't know. Uh, I'll have to do some some research on that, and I'll get back to you on, on that if I. If I find anything that is particularly useful for uh, for this, uh, what sort of beaches come between uh, five degree slope and ten degree slope? Those are those are usually known as transitional beaches, and I show I showed a photo of a of a transitional beach. In that case, was in the 
was along the uh, the east coast of uh, of Puerto Rico in a in a town called Luquillo there, and uh, just for reference, if if the person who asked this particular question uh, wants to you know go back again to the presentation, uh, eventually it's on slide 24, and it shows the La Selva Beach in Luquillo, and the first photo, the first photo photo on the left is actually a transitional beach. It's uh, and, uh, there, and you see the kind of like how it transition eventually to, in this case, I see at this beach. Um, so yeah, it's it's pretty much uh, the uh, a transitional phase between dissipative and uh, reflective beaches. Okay. Uh, can an estuary, the estuary be defined as a shoreline? And can you uh, explain the connection between estuary and gulf? I don't know what what it means by the second question in particular. Um, again, uh, in this case, geologically, I define the, the shoreline as the as the those two uh, lines between the high tide and low tides uh, here. In the general sense of what is a what a shoreline is, uh, right? Or well, let's say what a coastal environment is. Uh, yeah, definitely, an estuary can be part of the coastline, uh, and it depends on the on 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 the area, right? Um, so yeah, yeah, it, it can be not necessarily defined as a shoreline, but definitely part of the part of the shoreline or the coastline. Yeah. Um, can remote sensing be used to determine 13 be used to determine the underlying sediment type, i.e. sediment below the top layer, perhaps a, a recent uh, heavy rainfall event resulted in the deposition of modest the regional sediments across the beach, which is normally covered by biogenic ocean-based sediment. I'm not sure about that. You know, typically when you use remotely sensed uh, data, the information received by the sensor is, is basically what is reflected from the surface, and uh, and in that sense, um, that sense you will always, you only see what it's what is at the surface. But having said that, if 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 uh, I would say that probably if you have uh, image or data from you know before. And after the event, and 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 the the composition of the sediments changes, you know, dramatically. Something like a from very bright uh, beach sands to to a more kind of like a brownish or or even dark sands. You can probably definitely you know detect the the, the differences there. Um, but uh, but yeah, I have a I have a colleague at the University of Puerto Rico and. Uh, who actually provided uh, most of the uh, information that I presented today, and I'll ask her if, if there's a if there's anything that can be done around those sites, and and, and I'll I'll include it in the in the Q and A. And M Savi uh, uh, be used as a mineral identification, sand compositions uh, in bit. Uh, chores, I would say no, because MSAVI is a is a vegetation index, uh, not a sediment uh, composition index. I don't know if uh, if Amber is around, and I probably can talk a little bit about what MSAVI uh, is. You're more def definitely more versed on, on on this topic than myself. Hi, Juan. Yeah, um, SAVI is oftentimes used in um, regions where vegetation is sparse. Mm -hmm. where you're actually trying to uh, limit the impact of the bare ground and um, geologic features in the area mm -hmm. in order to focus on the change in vegetation. Um, so I would agree with you, Juan. I, I don't believe it's very useful for um, mineralogy um, because mm -hmm. it is trying to limit those impacts in order to focus on vegetation. Okay, cool. Thanks. And probably you can help me with the next one as well. Uh, is NDVI the same between different type of remote sensing image? Not clear about what what it, the person meant by that. But uh, can you can I compare the value of NDVI from ALOS, AF, uh, NIR, and Sentinel to assess the degradation of mangrove forests? Well, the NDVI is purely uh, indexed between the um, red and near infrared bands. 
Um, so you could uh, create NDVI from Sentinel-2 data, for example, um, and it will have the same ratio of the one to negative one. Um, so I would say that comparisons between Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8 in terms of NDVI are pretty comparable. Um, but you do also need to take into uh, consideration any kinds of atmospheric uh, uh, processing um, that have been done to the each sensor itself. And then also really keep in mind the wavelength range for each of those bands. Um, I'm not sure exactly what they are off the top of my head, but they could be slightly different between different satellites. Mm -hmm. um, and so just being aware of that, I think is important. And you may not have um, you know, e exactly the same values across a wide range of various um, satellite systems. But theoretically, the index could be used um, with any kind of sensor that has those two bands. Okay, thanks, yeah. Definitely, I, I totally agree. Um, okay, uh, question number uh, 16 there. How to map the changes of the shoreline in heavy mangrove coastal areas where we cannot see the shoreline? That's a very good question, actually. Uh, we had a similar situation in the project that I mentioned in the presentation in Southwest Puerto Rico, the, the high SPR project. And, uh, in that case, uh, we had a student, a, a graduate student working with us uh, doing, uh, she was doing a, an analysis of changes in, in the in mangrove cover around that, uh, the southwest coast of Puerto Rico. And, uh, and we used that, uh, the mangrove extension kind of as a proxy for, for, for shoreline changes because it was it was pretty much the same thing as what the person is asking. The mangroves were, were heavily you know, covering that area and just, definitely can see uh, show the shoreline. Um, I would think, uh, and this is just my guess, but I would think that uh, alternatively you can use a combination of, uh, if you have uh, historical aerial photos and, uh, and then um, maybe uh, combining that with uh, you know the, the aerial photos from the from let's say the 30s or 40s or 50s uh, with a uh, optical uh, uh, data from and you have Lanza data from the even from the 70s and then or you know, obviously more recently and then also if there's radar imagery can probably be used to separate uh, some of those uh, uh, components. Um, um, so I'll, I'll look a little bit more into this and and and, and, and provide some references if there if I find any. Um, for insert or and radar altimetry for bathymetry, do they use specific bands dedicated for penetrating the uh, water? Uh, I'm not a, a radar uh, expert, but uh, but uh, if uh, one thing that I'll mention is that uh, during the or SAR. Uh, force mapping webinar that, that uh, our uh, colleague uh, Erica Podes conducted with, with Amber and I back in May. Uh, she did cover in, in in a lot of detail uh, the the uh, the differences in the in the different bands of uh, of uh, synthetic aperture radar radar in particular and how. Uh, or, or let's say which of the, those bands can be used for for particular uh, areas. So uh, definitely, I would encourage the particular. I think it's in the first one or two sessions that uh, that this was covered in, in, in very in great de detail. So uh, yeah, definitely, uh, you can you can do you can go to the to the SAR more, uh, forest mapping webinar and, and get a lot more information about the different bands and, and how and if there's any that can be used. How do you classify wet dry line, vegetated line, high water line using remote sensing with uh, digital image processing techniques? Um, uh, several things here. If you have high resolution data, you can either literally do a manual delineation of all those features or even do uh, even a super bad classification. 
if, if the area is big enough or you have enough uh, uh, you know, pixels covering some of, uh, uh, all of those or, or any of those uh, uh, features. Uh, probably you can even use uh, an in, uh, uh, you know simple index like uh, NDVI or something similar to even separate vegetated versus non-vegetated areas, uh, or maybe some of the other indices that I that I mentioned uh, in, in one of the slides uh, for uh, for uh, for wetlands. So yeah. Um, can you re would you recommend any reliable research? on using satellite data to map marine debris. I mentioned a couple of papers um, that the, 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 the topic of, of using remote sensing for mapping marine debris is uh, fairly new, I would say. Um, I would uh, I will definitely include the, the references of those couple of papers that I, that I mentioned uh, on during the webinar, the one uh, there, there are two in particular. Um, one of them was uh, the paper of, uh, of Caraba and Heidi Dearson from, from 2018. And the other one was the, the Acuna Rose uh, paper conducted in, in, in Chile. And in case of the, of the, the, the latter one, the, the Acuna Rose, they used, uh, they, they used uh, in this case, uh, commercial data. So Worldview 3 data. For uh, uh, for marine debris. Um, which are the free satellite images imagery portals to download decades of old data for time season analysis? Uh, they are, uh, are they pre-processed or free from atmospheric and other noises, which would be very bad. So yeah, the uh, one of my colleagues here is. It's, it's answering the question, so go ahead. All, all NASA data is open and freely available, and there's a number of different portals that that, that you can use to to, to download the, uh, the data. And I think we covered this in the fundament, fundamentals on remote sensing and uh, and some of the other uh, webinars also. Uh, the uh, USGS Earth Explorer. Uh, it's probably one of the most um, mostly used uh, uh, portals for particularly for downloading uh, Landsat data. How river discharge affects the shoreline? Oh, that's a very good and very complicated question, actually. <laughs> very short, but very complicated. Um, it, the, uh, it, it depends on how big the discharge is, how frequent it is. Uh, for instance, we, we've seen places in the north coast of Puerto Rico with, our, with, our, with that project that I, that I mentioned during the, during the webinar, where the beach literally changed from one month to another. And uh, and that was uh, mostly as a consequence of uh, some heavy rainfall events, which uh, caused the, the the accumulation of uh, river uh, uh, sediments uh, in literally by tons in, in in that area and completely changed the the shoreline in the in that area. And then, and uh, and then, if there's uh, any erosional, other erosional or depositional events, so for instance, uh, erosional events like uh, ocean currents or heavy wave action, will also affect the uh, the, the shoreline and the and and how it, it either uh, accumulates, uh, how sediment sediment uh, accumulates on around the shoreline, or how it's uh, eroded. Uh, uh, on the other hand, so um, yeah, river discharge can be can greatly affect the uh, the shoreline and, and some of the features that we see along the shoreline. Do beaches stay dissipative or reflective forever or fluctuate between these two? That would depend on the site. Um, there's uh, there's some beaches that are that that are, that are on sites where. Well, the conditions are pretty constant, and they either stay dissipative or reflective, or 
uh, like some of the uh, again some one of the sites that I that I showed uh, the conditions there varied uh, quite a lot so that's why you see in the in those particular areas they they pretty much change almost on a monthly basis so it definitely depends on the uh, on the site um, were the beach sediments in slide 23 sampled in one place okay let's go a little bit let me let me just I have my I have a version of the presentation here open on my computer and yes uh yes exactly <laughs> those uh those uh those were those were the two beaches in the in the northwest northwest coast of puerto rico that i showed and yes the the the, the sediment samples were collected exactly in the same waypoint uh in in, in either beach so um yeah it's uh that's it shows it's it actually shows um you know kind of a on the same lines of the uh, uh the question back on how river discharge affects the, the shoreline this uh, actually shows how it affects the the shoreline in this case in terms of the sediment composition and and sediment size um uh so the answer is yes they were collected exactly at the same uh site uh uh, uh the samples in both uh in both beaches and you see you see how different they can be okay so maybe we can go uh a couple, one or two more and then like like we've done in the in the last uh, two weeks we can we can definitely uh we can definitely go uh, to uh, make sure that we answer the, the rest of them in the final Q&A uh, document. Uh, let's see, how do wetlands stabilize shorelines? Wetlands are very, very important, uh, uh, I would say, uh, coastal ecosystems because uh, particularly the root system of uh, uh, most of the uh, uh, of the wetland uh, plants like mangroves or or other plants depending on, on, on which type of wetland uh, it is the root system actually uh, serves as a, as a mean of of, uh, of retaining a lot of the sediment that go that uh that that flows uh through the through the coastline during during any any event uh so in that sense the uh the wetlands serve to to retain a lot of the the land material that can eventually populate some of the some of the other areas um wetlands also serve as a for, the, for instance during hurricanes or or a heavy wave action uh, or cyclonic waves they serve uh for uh, in in uh protection and coastline protection not only coastline but also inland protection uh, as well um in the so they pretty much serve as a buffer for uh, retaining for against uh, as a buffer against uh wave action um and uh and wind uh as well among other other uh, different factors in terms of how wetlands uh, you know stabilize the shoreline i just wanted to mention uh, a few of them uh, we know tidal changes could change the profile of a coastline in a given time uh -huh. is there any procedure to distinguish between coastline changes and uh, tidal changes uh again this is kind of referred back to, to what i mentioned earlier in, in one of the other questions um, um in terms of remote sensing um maybe the i would say the use of uh the, something like the waterline method which is one of the most widely used methods uh for uh, topography and bathymetry also uh, it can be one of the one of one, uh, one of the uh, a technique that uh, tool that can be used to distinguish between these um, because, like I said, it incorporates both hydrodynamics uh, modeling and uh, and also remote sensing data uh, as well. So it might be a, there's uh, that might be a way to to separate uh, uh, changes caused by you know usual tides or 
or, or other other factors, other uh, uh, atmospheric factors or, or, or weather related, related factors affecting the, the shoreline. How sonar data can be helpful for ocean bathymetric studies? Sonar data has been used for decades uh, to study the, the ocean floor. And uh, not only the ocean floor, but even to uh, a lot of uh, people, people in the fishing industry, they use sonar to to just find, you know, where uh, where particular schools of fishes are. Uh, <clears throat> um, so uh, yeah, so the use of sonar is is, is one of those classic uh, technologies that that's pretty much being used uh, right uh, now for probably I don't know, uh, definitely decades. Um, uh, it's one of the classic uh, type data types for, for bathymetric uh, studies. Are there any good models to model the sediment runoff from land water to the coastal area? Again, we covered some of this in, in the, particularly in the last session, session two. So uh, I would refer the, uh, the person to, to that. And we talked about the different. If you're using remote sensing, the how the the different components of the of the water column, uh, sediment versus CDOM or chlorophyll A, where do they absorb in the in the electromagnetic spectrum, and how uh, this affects the signal that you get uh, from from those. Um, okay. Okay, I'll go into the really a couple more. Then, uh, any advice on how to identify paleo mangroves, mangroves that have been killed by sand input and covered and partially covered by sand? No, honestly, no. It's not also. It's not my that, that's not my area of expertise. But uh, but uh, uh, no. You can do some, you know. Uh, Change at the change analysis uh, with with, uh, with with like a time series analysis and uh, with with data with with satellite data uh, or even uh, airborne data maybe and see how how the mangrove cover has changed through time and whether it's related to 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 sun or or not but that's probably as much as I can say uh, about that one in particular. Um, why can't there be a commercial uh, oops, uh, there is a commercial small hyperspectral coral camera can be developed that is designed to work with a particular sensor? <laughs> um, uh, there's uh, there's been some developments on hyperspectral cameras, particularly for, for drones. Um, these are there. These are still in in the. In, uh, they're still very basic. Uh, I would say uh, there's there's a couple out ones out there that were developed that has for land uses in particular, the may, for maybe applied for for coastal areas and particularly for for coral reefs. Um, and uh, and the advantage of those, like I said, I think was on the on the very first uh, session was that with hyperspectral cameras flown with drones, you'll have both. You have the high spectral resolution and you also have high spatial resolution. So you're flying it with a drone, so you probably get, you know, centimeter scale uh, spatial resolution for uh, uh, with, with, with those. But yeah, uh, those are uh, still in development and there are, there's, there's a lot of ground to cover. Uh, with with that topic in particular, uh, I think before they can be you know reliably uh, used for particularly for for underwater targets like coral reefs. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna uh, uh, stay here, but uh, but uh, I would. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure that in the final document, the final Q&A document, I will uh, we will go over some of the questions that, uh, that we still got pending. It's just for the for the sake of time. 
Uh, first, I want to thank uh, definitely all the participants. Uh, this was a record breaking uh, one for us, and we're very proud of it. And uh, and definitely I want to thank uh, all my colleagues, all the people uh, on the RSET team that's on the uh, backstage and making sure that this uh, webinar series run as uh, smoothly as they do. Uh, so Brock, Selwyn, Jonathan, David, uh, and uh, and all the others, uh, our director, Ana Prados, uh, definitely my colleague, Amber McCollum, my, my, my friend and colleague, uh, Roy Armstrong, who was with us uh during these sessions uh like i said pretty be uh, be uh as I, like i said at the beginning uh, make sure that you do if you want to get uh, the certificate make sure that you do the uh the homework the homework is available on the on the training web page uh also there it's, it's available there it's relatively simple homework uh of uh, multiple choices and some true or falses, uh, not a big thing. Uh, but it's really important for you to submit the the homework, if particularly if you want the uh, to be able to uh, to to do the to to get the certificate. The homework can be found. It's a Google form that you submit, and it can be found on the web page uh, of these uh, of the webinar series. And there's only one homework. Some people have been asking about if that they can see homeworks for session one and, and two. Uh, no, there's only one homework for the whole uh, webinar. Uh, so you just submit that one and then and then uh, and then eventually you'll get your certificate if you also participated in the three sessions. Uh, remember that because of the high volume of participants, uh, it takes some time to process all of this. So you should expect the certificate be uh, maybe within two or three months, uh, depending on how fast we can do it. But it takes it takes time. So don't don't uh, don't, don't get desperate if you, you you'll get it uh, eventually. Again, thank you very much uh, uh, to all of you. Have a great week and stay tuned for other uh, RSET webinars. All right, take care.